continue to order. Uh, could I have approval of the minutes from September the 2nd, 2021? So moved. So moved by uh, 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 Councillor Cleary, second by Councillor Lovelace. Uh, all those in favor? We now have approved minutes. We're now looking at the approval and the order of business and approval of additions and deletions. Is there any uh, change to the order of uh, business? Seeing none, if we could have someone move them, uh, Councillor uh, Clearly and uh, second by Councillor Dago Gavin. All those in favor? We now have an agenda. Any business arising out of the minutes? Seeing none, a call for a declaration of conflict of interests. Nobody owns a plastics company here or anything on council? Okay, well, that's good. Number six is motions of reconsideration, motions of rescissions, consideration of deferred business, notice of table matters, all none. And now we come to 10 correspondence, petitions and delegations. Madam Clerk, are there any correspondence? Thank you, Mr. Chair. There has been four pieces of correspondence and it has been circulated to the committee. Great, thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, petitions, any petitions? Seeing none, uh, we now get into uh, the meat of the meeting where we start off with presentations. And the first one up is 10.3.1 Wetland uh, Conservation in a Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes Wilderness Area. And uh, Emma Bocking is with us. Emma, welcome, come forward. Nice to see you, Emma. Thank you for coming. Uh, you have a, an actual visual presentation to you also, or? Yes, I do. Uh, so they're, uh, are they queuing, are you, Madam Clerk, are you queuing that up for her, or is she doing it on her own? It's uh, in front of me here on the screen. I'm not sure if others can see it. So they're working on that, yeah. Wonderful. So we'll get it up and then we'll turn the floor over to you. There we go. So Emma, again, welcome. Thank you very much. You have uh, 10 minutes uh, for your presentation. And after your presentation, if anyone from the committee uh, have questions, we'll have an opportunity to ask those questions at that time. Uh, I hand the floor over to you. Okay, great. Thanks so much for Thanks. having me here this afternoon. I was just saying before the meeting started that I think this is my first in-person presentation since COVID began. So uh, <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here. and. Um, a little bit nervous, but I'm sure we'll get through that just fine. Well, don't be nervous. Uh, we've gotten rid of any committee members that uh, used to bite, so uh, we feel <laughs> we're fine. Wonderful. That's exactly what I was afraid of, so that's perfect. All right, so uh, my name is Emma. I work for Ducks Unlimited Canada here in Halifax. Uh, so Ducks Unlimited is a uh, national wetland conservation charity. We protect, uh, restore, uh, engage the public and youth about wetlands across Canada. And we do that because wetlands are important, uh, not just for ducks, but for uh, lots of wildlife and most importantly, uh, for people as well, which is really the main focus of the talk today. So I'll be focusing on uh, some of the wetland work that I've been doing in the municipality over the last two years. Uh, but with a particular emphasis on a couple wetlands in the Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes area. And I put here watersheds with an S in brackets because as we'll see, it covers a couple watersheds, but we'll be focusing on one in particular. And I should mention as well, uh, the work that we do at Ducks is very collaboration focused. Uh, so I am a wetland specialist, but I'm by no means an expert on the Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes area. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the folks at the Nature Trust and the Friends of Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes. They know a lot about that area. I've had the pleasure of working with them, uh, but I'm happy to answer questions around wetlands any day at any time. <laughs> so I like to start off with a little bit of an introduction because I know that everyone knows what a wetland is, but I just like to show a lot of beautiful pictures as well. Uh, so all of the pictures that I'll show in this presentation are wetlands within central Halifax, which is kind of neat. So when a lot of people uh, first talk to me about wetlands, they have in their mind this image of duck habitat, uh, cattails, lily pads, uh, but in fact, this is only one type of wetland. So there are freshwater marshes, such as pictured here. Uh, there's also tidal marshes. So this is um, Chesicook out on the Eastern shore. Uh, shallow open water, this is in uh, upper Sackville. Um, treed wetlands or swamps, this is in uh, off the Shearwater Flyer Trail. 
uh, more closed systems like a fen, which is a type of organic wetland. Uh, this is in Dartmouth, Eisner Cove wetland. Uh, and then even more closed systems, these are bogs. So bogs are neat types of wetlands because they often have no surface water on them at all, and they get all of their water from uh, rain and snow. So they can actually be quite dry depending on the time of year. And this is in uh, the Goodwood area of West Halifax. So I'd like to go over these different types of wetlands. It's important because it's important to keep in mind that different wetland types provide different types of ecosystem services. So it's important to start thinking about a diversity of wetland types. Uh, so wetlands, as you're aware, are important for all sorts of different reasons, especially in urban areas. So they improve water quality, they store carbon, uh, they help mitigate the impacts of floods by holding on to water on the landscape and really acting like a sponge. They cool surface water, which is really important for fish habitat. Uh, they provide space for plants and animals that you won't find in any other type of habitat. And people enjoy going to wetlands and participating in various different recreation activities there. So in Atlantic Canada, we use a tool called the Wetland Ecosystem Services Protocol to measure uh, different ecosystem services that wetlands provide. So I could talk for hours about this tool and how it works and why we use it, but I'll just say that uh, it's a rapid assessment tool and it gives a picture of 18 different ecosystem services and how wetlands provide, how individual wetlands provide those services and the benefits that those wetlands give to their watersheds. All right, here is quite a colorful map, so I'll, I'll walk through it step by step. Uh, so this map kind of gives a snapshot of some of the work that we've been doing in Halifax over the last two years. Each black dot represents a wetland where we performed that wetland assessment, so where we have a picture of the ecosystem services of that wetland. And the colored polygons are secondary watersheds. So a watershed is a, a topographic term or tool. It's kind of like a bathtub on the, on the landscape. So at the, every drop of water that falls in a watershed will flow to the same place. So when we start to think about uh, the idea of planning around watersheds, we realize that what happens at the top of a watershed and what we put into the water will flow down throughout the watershed and impact everything happening downstream. So this starts to relate to an area like Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes, where we really care about the quality of those lakes, where people swim, uh, we're protecting it as a wilderness area, we're putting all of this effort into doing that. So we have to make sure we think about the entire watershed and what is happening upstream of it as well. So the colors of the polygons of the watersheds represent the percent of wetland cover. And this is based off of the provincial wetland inventory, which is uh, a little bit out of date, but that's a whole other uh, topic of discussion. Um, so as you can see, most of the watersheds in Halifax in HRM, in the central HRM area, have uh, less than 6% wetland cover, um, which is normal in a city uh, that's developed quite a bit recently, but it's something to keep an eye on um, when we're thinking about using all of the ecosystem services that wetlands can, can provide for us. So I'm gonna focus on this orange block here. This is the Kearney Lake watershed. So let's look at what it looks like on the ground. Um, this is about half or approximately half of the Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes areas in this watershed. You can, yeah, you can see my mouse. This is a Bears Lake area down here. Uh, this is Belcher's Marsh, neat little wetland, uh, Kearney Lake, and then the, so the, this is the top of the watershed. So again, that idea of everything that happens up here will eventually flow down through the watershed and it drains out into the Bedford Basin up here. So I, We'll be focusing on three wetlands that we assessed last summer. So the first is Washmill Lake wetland here at the southern end of Washmill Lake uh, beside the quarry. A Susie Lake wetland, which intercepts a stormwater inflow from Highway 102 before it enters Susie Lake. And Mainland Common Bog, which sits right at the top of the watershed in the Mainland Common Park. So uh, Washmill Lake, um, as you can see, a beautiful wetland. 
I'll, I'll kind of go over the top three functions that each wetland is providing based on this assessment that we did. So uh, important wildlife habitat, sediment retention, and nitrate, nitrate retention. So wildlife, particularly for uh, pollinators and other invertebrates um, and amphibians and turtles, uh, sediment and nitrate retention are particularly important when you're starting to think about water quality downstream. Uh, excess of nitrates in particular can lead to blue-green algae blooms. We have Susie Lake wetland. Uh, you might notice in the picture that the water uh, is a little bit odd looking. So this wetland receives quite a bit of stormwater inflow from a uh, stream running off of the Highway 102. So it has quite a bit of stress. Uh, it's still able to provide several valuable functions such as water storage and delay and phosphorus retention in addition to wildlife and plant habitat. And this is mainland common bog. So this is a neat site. It's very easy to access. It's in a municipal park. It's very close to a high school, so there's lots of education opportunities as well. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit different than those other wetlands because it's a bog, there's no surface water, so it's, it's very good at storing carbon, and it's very effective at water storage in particular because you could think of it as really a sponge at the top of the watershed uh, it's very effective at storing that water and delaying it so that it doesn't run off and, and cause flooding. And the other side of that water storage coin is that during dry periods, um, the wet, wetlands can slowly release water back into surface water systems. So when we think about climate change and these flashy floods and more, more storms and higher intensity storms, and also on the flip side, more droughts, wetlands are very important and they store carbon. So really they meet our adaptation and mitigation goals. They're quite amazing systems. But specifically to do with Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes, uh, these are just three examples of wetlands that are providing a diversity of ecosystem services to ensure water quality for that system. So in summary, uh, watershed scale planning ensures downstream water quality. So when we want to protect areas, we can't just think of the land within that border, we have to think of that whole watershed and the water that is entering those systems. Conserving a diversity of wetland types in a watershed uh, is important to ensure that we benefit from that whole range of ecosystem services. And for the last two, uh, the main stressors for wetlands relate to water quality and water quantity. So that's both the timing and the amount of water. Uh, and stormwater can impact all of those things. It can have an inflow of road salt and contaminants, and it also leads to a flasher hydro period, so water that enters the wetland too quickly during storms. And good buffer zones mitigate some of those stresses. Uh, so you have that protective space around a wetland that allows for water to infiltrate before entering the system. So that's, um, that's it for me, and I'll take any questions. Well, thank you very much, Emma. You had no reason to be nervous. Uh, you did an excellent job, and I appreciate your passion for what you do. It's, it's quite evident in your presentation. Thank you. Uh, well, questions for the floor? I see Councillor uh, Pamela Lovelace. Uh, Councillor Lovelace, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation, Emma. It's so nice to see you and feel your passion in person. <laughs> really appreciate it. Um, so a couple of things uh, that I'd like to know about uh, is this provincial wetland inventory. I understand it's been out of date. It actually hasn't been updated since 2000. Do we have any sense uh, as far as when um, that is going to take place? Uh, do, do we know if there is a, a movement at the province to update that inventory? And I also wanted to chat with you about the quality of stormwater uh, because it is a concern uh, overall uh, with Halifax water, with stormwater expanding, uh, with Halifax water expanding their stormwater service um, throughout uh, further areas um, in uh, HRM. And I'm wondering whether or not uh, you know of any kind of assessment that's been done uh, with the lands and forests to look at the mitigation 
for that quality to ensure that there is more of a buffer uh, around uh, these wetland areas. And in specifically, if there is an opportunity uh, potentially to work with Halifax Water and to determine what kind of quality uh, initiatives uh, can we put in place uh, with, with HRM and Halifax Water to ensure that that stormwater is of better quality for our wetlands. Thank you. questions. <laughs> uh, so that's mapping, uh, stormwater, and the buffers around the wetlands to mitigate against stormwater. Yes, water. thank you. All right. Uh, so for wetland mapping, that is an issue that has come up quite a lot. And I should add that we have been able to work uh, with HRM staff and the Environment Department and Regional Planning and have and met with them and they're, they've been good to work with. And one of the first and last things that always comes up is we need better data to work with mm -hmm. for planning. Um, and it has come up at the provincial level as well. One of the uh, funny things about wetlands in the province is that they are, um, the, the wetland policies run by the Department of Environment and Climate Change and the wetland inventory uh, sits with the Department of Natural Resources and Renewables or Lands and Forestry. Um, so they are starting to speak together more about that. And in particular, forested wetlands are very underrepresented in the inventory. Mm -hmm. But something, a recent development that will really help with improving the inventory is uh, better LIDAR data that has been released. So this is more detailed, a more detailed mapping layer. Uh, and it's, you're able to do a faster, more accurate wetland map using this type of data. It's like um, very detailed surface level information down to half a meter or 10 centimeter resolution. So wow. if you have the skills to do remote sensing, then you're able to look at that and get a picture of where wetlands are. And then mm -hmm. it would be a ground truthing effort to kind of finalize that map. Okay. Uh, so the main thing in the way is having someone in place at the provincial level who has the capacity and the time to really put that together. Um, but there are a lot of people that would like to see a better wetland inventory and something that we've been talking about in HRM is maybe looking at um, a watershed by watershed approach and maybe starting in an area like Blue Mountain, Birch Cove Lakes or the Kearney Lake watershed and uh, starting there with the slider information that we have available and some manageable size. Um, a summer student or a master's student could go out and do the ground truth thing and then piece by piece we'd have a better wetland inventory, at least for central HRM. So for the stormwater, I, I'm not aware of uh, the Department of Natural Resources and Renewables working on the stormwater in particular. Uh, that is something <laughs> else that should be worked on more, I would say. Uh, there is more information and data out there about the value of green infrastructure. Uh, so having naturalized stormwater ponds that uh, look more, uh, are more appealing in neighborhoods compared to um, gray infrastructure ponds. Uh, and they also provide more ecological benefits mm -hmm. and they're more effective at, at uh, cleaning stormwater as well. Um, you could also do smaller things like rain gardens or bioswales. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are a lot of options out there and, and municipalities that have taken that on. Um, in terms of buffers around wetlands. Um, from what I understand, there is already, there are, are places in the regional plan where there are buffers around wetlands, but mm -hmm. sometimes it's more interpreted as buffers around uh, water courses and open water. Um, so it will be important in the regional plan review to make sure that that buffer definition includes all wetlands uh, and that that buffer width is expanded if possible, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe most importantly that it's properly enforced. Um, it, that, I, I think that's a challenge that every jurisdiction in Canada has trouble with. It's really hard to enforce riparian buffers, uh, especially on private land. Um, so 
yeah, I, I hope that answers your questions. Those are great <laughs> questions. <laughs> You're good, uh, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, next up, um, uh, the Vice Chair, Catherine Morris, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much, Emma. A wonderful presentation. Um, I just had a couple questions. Um, do you have a sense of what type of buffer would be ideal around wetlands in terms of size? And also, could you talk a little bit about? Um, uh, which wetlands would be most critical to protect if we were um, going to be wanting to protect the water quality overall in Blue Mountain area? Sure. Uh, the, the recommended width of buffers is about 30 meters minimum. Uh, I think right now in Halifax it's 15 meters with a recommendation for 20 meters. So I say 30 because anything over what we have now is, is good and it's better to, to aim high, but in, um, in the literature, 30 meters is recommended to provide that adequate space. It, depend, it does depend on a slope and location and it can be hard to nail down an, a good golden rule buffer for all wetlands in all places, but uh, 30 meters is a good goal to shoot for. Uh, in terms of particular wetlands, I would say if we needed to have a prioritized list to start with those that are intercepting uh, storm water before they enter the lakes. Uh, so that second wetland that I mentioned, I don't know if you can still see my screen, but uh, this Susie Lake wetland here, I call it the Susie Lake wetland. I don't think it has um, a formal name, but that middle circle on the map, um, it's it's taking quite a bit of stress, so what I could see happening is somehow infiltrating some of that stormwater before it enters the wetland and allowing it time to recover. Uh, but it, it, the, the wetland outflow goes almost immediately into Susie Lake, which is an important lake for swimming um, and just to have it as good water quality in general. So I would say uh, ensuring good water quality in that wetland would be important. Um, we did an informal water quality, we just had a little handheld water quality tool that we use in the field, and we took a measurement at, in the wetland and then at the outflow of the wetland. Um, and it was, I, that was two years ago, so I don't remember the exact numbers, but it, is, it was different. It, the, the water quality leaving the wetland was better than what was going in, and that, that's pretty common. Uh, wetlands really do a lot to, to clean water. Um, so I would say that would be an important wetland to protect. Uh, there's another wetland that we did not assess, but it's a little bit smaller. It's if you're standing at in the Kent parking lot, looking with the Highway 102 on your right. Um, it's kind of just down the ravine. It's another similar sort of boggy wetland. That would be another one to consider protecting. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Any other questions? See no other questions, if you don't mind, colleagues. I have a couple, if, if I may, from here. Um, so, uh, Emma, you know, our, it wasn't clear in your presentation where I may have missed it. You know, are wetlands protected? I mean, are, if there's a wetland, it's identified, and if it has, if it's part of the inventory and it's identified, does that mean it's protected? Yep, that's a great question. Uh, so, there is a Provincial Wetland Conservation Policy, and as I, I said, it's administered by the Department of Environment and Climate Change. And the goal of the policy is no net loss on a provincial scale. So if there is um, a request to, for development that will impact a wetland, the proponent needs to make a request to the department to impact that wetland. And then it goes through uh, uh, a hierarchy of mitigation pyramid, I guess you could say. So the first, uh, they have to prove that they've done all they can to avoid wetland impact. Uh, secondly, they have to do prove that they've done all they could to minimize any impact that is being done. And the third and uh, I guess least preferred option is that they have to compensate for any wetland loss that does occur. So this compensation uh, has to happen at a ratio of two to one. So for every hectare of wetland lost, the proponent needs to pay for two hectares of wetland to be compensated. 
and this compensation is generally done through wetland restoration um, delivered by restoration practitioners across the province um, of which we are one and it's at a two to one ratio because it's recognized that restored wetlands are not as uh, functionally good as natural wetlands and you're exchanging um, an existing natural wetland that is a certain a certainty and certainly providing functions for a, a restored wetland that will appear in the future and may or may not provide those same functions so hence we do a two to one ratio um, so wetlands are protected but they can be developed uh, if the proponent can pay for that development. So currently that compensation fee is around uh, $36,000 a hectare. And one of the challenges in a place like HRM is that it's very difficult to find good wetland restoration opportunities because once a wetland here is impacted, uh, it can't be restored because it's often filled in and under houses or or road or whatnot, unlike in an agricultural landscape where it's not too complicated to restore wetland comparatively. So that's the first thing, it's hard to restore close to the loss. Um, and the second is that because the price of land is so valuable, um, that $36,000 a hectare is uh, not as much of a deterrent in Halifax as it might be in other areas of the province. So where the policy works best is where that price deters people from developing wetlands at all because they can't factor that into their costs, so they just build somewhere else, and that happens, uh, which is great. That's what the policy is there to do. But in HRM, it's not, um, the challenge is a high cost of land, so it's just part of the cost of, of development, and um, it's, so you're losing those functions often within certainly within the watershed and often within the municipality. Um, so some potential solutions to that could be um, having a higher ratio, so making it more expensive to, um, to develop on wetlands, so having more than a two to one, um, or being more flexible to not just restoring wetlands in other places of the province, but doing things like uh, purchasing land or purchasing natural wetlands within Halifax, um, we're doing green infrastructure projects and things like that. Well, uh, Emma, I wish I had your presentation prior to our last council meeting. In our last council meeting, we needed to approve expansion to Burnside, which is a good thing, but there are wetlands in Burnside, and so now I have some homework and some questions I'll be uh, having with uh, staff based on your presentation. So thank you very much. I see no further questions. And once again, uh, thank you for what you do and what Ducks Unlimited does uh, for our environment. I really appreciate it, Emma. Thank you. So up next, let's see, uh, we're now going into um, information items brought forward. Uh, there are none. We're at 12 reports uh, and discussions, and we have a staff report, 12.1.1, Municipal Electric Vehicle Strategy. I know that we're very excited to hear about this one. I believe there's a staff presentation. To, uh, uh, Kevin, is that correct? I see movement. So uh, if Kevin, you've, there's a presentation, correct? Yeah, if you could give us uh, your, your presentation, then we'll put the motion on the floor for uh, discussion. So uh, uh, welcome, Kevin, introduce yourself, and uh, the floor is yours. Perfect, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, Environment Committee. My name is Kevin Bootler, and I am the Clean Energy Specialist um, with uh, the Energy and uh, the Environment and Climate Change Division in uh, Infrastructure Planning within Planning and Development. And I'm very pleased to be here today to talk about the electric vehicle strategy um, that, uh, uh, yeah, so. 
Uh, so the electric vehicle strategy is a response to uh, the passing of the Health Act, um, as, uh, as you've all seen this many times before, and I'm sure you're aware. Um, but one of the core critical actions was to develop an electric vehicle strategy. Um, and that is in response to the fact that in 2016, about 20% of our community-wide emissions um, comes from the transportation sector. And of that 20%, 90% of that um, comes from light-duty vehicles. So while Halifax, the plan, it recommends getting people out of their personal vehicles, get them on the bus, active transportation, or whatever it may be. Um, you know, we are a very large municipality, so it's not, uh, not feasible for some to actually get out of their personal vehicle, and those that are left, we want them to be zero emission or electric. Um, this is an extremely ambitious task, uh, as uh, there is nearly half a million registered light duty vehicles um, in the province, and only about four of them today, or 400 of them today are electric. Um, sometime last year, I think it was last February, we procured Dunsky Consulting um, to work with us in development of this electric vehicle strategy, uh, a fantastic firm to work with as they've done um, several uh, other strategies in, uh, in large cities across Canada, Toronto being one, Calgary as well. Um, and what we wanted them to do is to develop a strategy, a made for HRM strategy that looked at public infrastructure, policy, um, and uh, education needs uh, to make Halifax an EV ready city. We also wanted them to provide a recommendation on a light duty fleet transition plan for our municipality as well. Um, there was a lot of consultation um, while developing this plan and I want to uh, throw a thank you, a huge thank you to some of the key stakeholders, um, the province of Nova Scotia, the Clean Foundation, the Ecology Action Center, uh, Nova Scotia Power, Steel Auto, and the Electric Vehicle Association of Atlanta, Canada, um, which, uh, which has uh, many members of the public that are passionate um, and really have the inside knowledge of the barriers uh, across, the, across our, our municipality. Uh, so uh, the first uh, realm of the strategy, I suppose, um, is uh, public charging infrastructure. So one of the most common barriers to, uh, to getting into an electric vehicle is range anxiety. And what range anxiety is, is the, the idea that, hey, I'm gonna have an electric vehicle and I have nowhere to, to fuel that electric vehicle. Um, it is uh, somewhat of a misconception uh, because approximately about 80% of the charging actually do, is done at the home. Um, however, um, the lack of public infrastructure can cause this anxiety. Um, so it's very important um, uh, to, to, to in, uh, have public infrastructure that's visible for folks that one, either don't own a home, um, or to just show the, uh, um, the public that uh, investments are being made within this, uh, this industry. Uh, over the past few years, Nova Scotia Power has done some great jobs, uh, some great work um, deploying fast chargers across the province. Uh, however, in the sector currently, there really isn't anyone um, taking the role. So uh, it is recommended that the municipality lead that in the initial stages um, to spur, to spur um, that private uh, development uh, after the fact. Um, sorry. Uh, so Dunsky, what they did is they used their EV adoption model and they took a look at the current baseline of charging within our municipality. They looked at the average driving distance um, within uh, folks within the municipality uh, and the number of multi-unit dense areas and they developed a, uh, a public infrastructure deployment plan. Um, and within the strategy, there is recommended locations across the municipality which span from um, rural to downtown urban uh, so that anyone that does get an electric vehicle has access um, to, to public electric vehicle charging. Uh, in brief, the, uh, the strategy recommends 1,000 level two ports and 100 DC fast current ports installed within the municipality uh, by 2030. Um, it's important to note that these would not all be funded or um, even supported generally by HRM. Um, this would be a mix of municipal and community led initiatives. Um, I guess a quick sidebar, level two ports, for those that aren't familiar, uh, is, uh, is something that's typically seen at the home or in areas where, uh, where you're at a sporting event or you're at the park or, uh, or at the library where you're, you're uh, at a spot for only two hours or so and you need a top up or at the host where you have about eight hours to charge your car uh, fully. 
Uh, DC fast charger is more akin to, uh, to a gas station. Uh, they're getting much more powerful as the years go on, but typically you're going to see a full charge within say 45 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes. So that's great on, uh, on highways um, and for, for travel and for those folks that do live in Mervs that don't currently have access to at-home charging. In July, the municipality did submit an application to Natural Resources uh, Canada's Zero Emission Vehicle Infrastructure Program. That program offers 50% uh, cost sharing for the design and install of electric vehicle charging stations. Uh, we applied for uh, funds for 115 uh, charging stations, so about 106 level two ports and nine DC fast chargers. We're hoping to hear back in December, uh, and if we are successful in that, we uh, are planning to start the design uh, early next fiscal. Uh, currently, there are no tariffs specific from Nova Scotia Power specific to electric vehicle charging. So the cost of electricity at your charging station depends on what your rate code is. So if you're at your host, it's a residential rate code. If you're at a commercial facility, it's at the commercial rate code. Um, this can make the operation costs somewhat difficult to determine because it does depend again on what your rate code is and how many stations are there, how often it's being used. Um, so in an effort to minimize the energy and demand and the cost for operation, uh, we will be designing these to keep our demand costs low. The demand costs, so the demand charges are really what can uh, increase the, uh, the, the operating costs. Um, and what we will be doing, and we'll be coming forward to council should this be approved in a, at a later date um, with uh, appropriate fees and enforcement mechanisms so that the operating costs are, are covered. Um, and it's important to note that uh, the cost for charging an electric vehicle is about a quarter of the cost of filling up at the gas station. Um, so even if there is a cost associated with this public charging, um, it's still a better alternative than heading to the gas station and filling up your tank. The, uh, the, uh, the next area of the strategy is EV policies. So um, while a lot of folks, um, well, you know, putting out electric vehicle charging, public charging will signal to the consumer that investments are being made. Um, for those that do not have home charging, it, it can still be uh, a, a difficult transition to make. Approximately 10% of residents within our municipality live in multi-use residential buildings. With the center pan plan passing and the increase in density that's expected, uh, it, it's likely that um, all new mixed-use development that is built today will see 100% EV penetration within its lifetime. Uh, so it's very important to uh, encourage MERBs installing uh, and developers installing electric vehicle charging uh, in their parking lots. Uh, municipalities in British Columbia, they have the authority to mandate this within their developments. We currently do not. Um, so under our uh, under our, uh, the building code, we're governed by the building code. Uh, the building code does not uh, give us the authority to, uh, to make this a requirement at the development stage. Uh, so it's recommended that uh, we ask the, uh, that we ask the minister um, in charge of the building code to uh, allow amendments to the building code so the municipality can mandate EV ready charging stalls in new development. So EV ready charging stalls, what that entails is all the infrastructure, conduit, breakers, wires, everything except for the physical charging station to be installed when the building is being built. Um, this is about half the price of retrofitting after the fact. And like I said, um, with likely 100% EV penetration within the lifetime of these buildings, retrofits are most likely in the future. Uh, the, uh, that takes care of the new buildings. With the, uh, the existing buildings, it is going to be a little bit more expensive, so we will be looking to include uh, financing for this transition within programs like the Solar City program or the underdevelopment uh, retrofit renewables and resiliency program. Uh, the municipality uh, can also play a huge role in educating the public, and we've already begun doing this. So we've partnered with the Clean Foundation's Next Ride program, and what that is is they go to different areas within Nova Scotia. They have a number of electric vehicles, and they let the public test drive the vehicles. They answer uh, questions, they dispel misconceptions, uh, and they just it's, it's non-biased education to property owners. Uh, we've uh, already supported them in a couple of events where we've let them use our municipal sites. 
Uh, we've done one at uh, the Tantallon Recreation Center, the Sackville Sportsplex, uh, in uh, the Forepad in Dartmouth, and then this one, which uh, is on the screen, a, a nice advertisement for them, uh, on November 9th. Uh, they'll be at the Saxophone Sports Stadium uh, as well. Uh, finally, when it comes to municipal EV policies and education, um, even with the installation of public charging infrastructure, home to at, uh, at, at home charging, there is a lack of available electric vehicles in in Nova Scotia. So stats state that a one in 10 uh, v, uh, dealerships actually have an electric vehicle for sale. Uh, a lot of individuals um, that, that I know and that I, that I follow through, uh, through social media typically have to purchase it from Ontario or uh, out west um, without even you know, test driving. And it, it, it's very difficult to, to get someone into an electric vehicle or a vehicle for that matter um, without even testing that vehicle. Um, so to enable this adoption, we need a zero emission vehicle mandate, um, which sets an EV sales target for automakers, ensuring a robust supply for consumers at the dealership. Uh, a ZEV mandate uh, would be in line with the federal government, which has a 100% new EV sales by 2035, and Quebec, which has the same target. Uh, the province of Nova Scotia and their Environment Goals and Climate Change Reduction Act, which was introduced last week, um, does have a zero emission vehicle mandate um, that is 30% uh, new vehicles are electric by 2030. Um, it is recommended uh, through this strategy that uh, we um, write a letter to the Premier to strengthen that 30%. Um, especially if the federal target is going to be 100% by 2035, um, the strategy uh, recommends that, that we do strengthen that uh, from 30%. And while we'll be encouraging the public to get in electric vehicles, um, the municipality does have uh, the responsibility to act as a leader. Uh, this, and, uh, this aligns with the Halifax motion of net zero municipal operations by 2030, uh, and uh, it would be requiring the switch of all our light duty fleet to fully electric by 2030. We currently have about 550 light duty vehicles within our fleet. Um, one of the biggest concerns with fleet, who was a huge partner in developing this portion of the strategy, was that can the operational needs uh, be met? Our municipality is, is huge, as we all know. Um, so can we meet those operational needs? Dunsky ran an analysis based on every vehicle and how much our vehicle drives throughout the course of a day. Uh, on average, the, uh, the most distance that one of our municipal fleet vehicles drives is about 300 kilometers per day. Um, and all vehicles, uh, all electric vehicles that exist can, can meet that, can meet that, uh, that need. Um, so that is a non-issue, non which is fantastic. Um, Dunsky has developed a roadmap that shows when each vehicle in our current fleet needs to be retired and replaced uh, with an electric vehicle. And while this uh, transition is, uh, is very ambitious and needs to be done by 2030. There will be some vehicles that have not reached the end of their lifetime. Um, and even factoring that in, um, it is still feasible to, to make that trans transition. And I'll talk about the feasibility in just a moment. Um, without a zero emission vehicle mandate, the supply is going to be an issue. Um, so if this strategy is approved by uh, council, um, we, and the next budget is approved by council, we will be issuing a multi-year RFP. Um, we've, there's been indication from dealerships that they are more than happy to have stock available if we were to show um, that uh, volume is needed in the, in the next uh, five, to, five to 10 years. Um, to reduce charging costs at our municipal facilities, we are going to employ share shared charging, um, so that what that means is you can have several charging ports on one breaker that reduces the demand charges at that facility. And since a number of our vehicles are back at the home base by five o'clock, you've got from five o'clock until five the next morning, you've got 12 hours um, to charge a, a vehicle. So you do not need one dedicated charging station for each vehicle. And if this transition were to be complete by 2030, with the current grid forecast, uh, we would see a 65% emission reduction uh, for our fleet with the announcement of the provincial government of an 80% uh, renewable grid by 2030, that emission reduction will be, will be higher. 
Uh, on average, an electric vehicle today, purchased today, comes with a 30% premium. Uh, even with that capital cost, the savings on maintenance and the savings on fuel um, will result in a lower life cycle cost by 2030. This graph does not include future incentives um, or the future cost of uh, fuel, carbon pricing, or, or anything like that. So this essentially displays and, and, and shows that even with the current conditions today, um, transitioning to a 100% electric light duty fleet um, is feas feasible in the long run. Uh, these are the financial implications of uh, the electric vehicle strategy for the next 10 years. Um, as mentioned, the fleet vehicle transition and the fleet charging, um, while there is you know, a substantial capital cost, um, this will all be covered uh, throughout the life cycle of, uh, of using the vehicles. Um, the public charging is, uh, on the higher side in the initial years as a municipality um, deploys public charging. However, we will be working with uh, private uh, entities um, and the utilities and the province um, to, uh, to increase adoption uh, and to achieve that 1,000 level two and 100 fast chargers. Um, so that brings me to my recommend, or the recommendation. Uh, there's three recommendations. Uh, with this strategy. The first is adopt the Halifax Regional Municipality electric vehicle strategy as set out in attachment A or one of this report. Recommend that the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing prescribe additional standards by regulation of the Building Code Act to require EV ready parking stalls for the construction of new buildings within the municipality uh, and request the mayor write a letter to the minister requesting these regulations. And number three, request a mayor write a letter to the premier of Nova Scotia requesting that the zero emission vehicle mandate introduced uh, in the current environment act be strengthened to better align with Halifax. And I am more than happy to take any and all questions. Thanks. Kevin, thanks very much for that presentation. Uh, very informative. Uh, it's nice to see, uh, again, more action coming out of Halifax. Uh, that, that's very exciting. Uh, Councillor Austin, would you mind putting the motion on the floor that he just read and read it again, please? And then you can <laughs> ask your questions. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I move that uh, the Environmental uh, Environment and Sustainability Standing Committee recommend that Regional Council 1 adopt the Halifax Regional Municipality Electric Vehicle Strategy as set out in Attachment 1 of this report. 2. Recommend that the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing prescribe additional standards by regulation of the building code to require EV ready parking stalls for the construction of new bu buildings within the Halifax Regional Municipality and request the Mayor write a letter to the Minister requesting these regulations. And three, request the Mayor write a letter to the Premier of Nova Scotia requesting that the zero emission vehicle mandate introduced in the Environment Goals and Climate Change Reduction Act be strengthened to better align with Halifax. Second from uh, Councillor Lovelace. Uh, Councillor, do you have the floor? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Kevin and team, uh, for all the work on this. It's very exciting to get uh, some chunks of Halifax moving forward in the uh, implementation world. Uh, so uh, I, I'm going to own up front. I have not had a chance to read this. I had a full morning already, and we didn't get the report until uh, something like eight or nine this morning. So I haven't. So I'm only going on your presentation. I will read it, of course, before it comes to Regional Council. Um, the only thing I just wanted to ask about, um, the strategy, uh, we're focused on that light vehicle fleet. Have we had conversations about um, fleet in terms of our other uses? Because I know a couple of us have been very interested and in, uh, Chief Steubing has expressed some interest in um, actually electric fire trucks. So this is something new that's being rolled out elsewhere in uh, the world, in Europe, and nor uh, even here in North America. There's a, there's a fire truck manufacturer that's building small smaller electric fire trucks. And so I'm just wondering, um, obviously the light vehicles are the easier, it's the more, it's the simpler, it's the, it's the low hanging fruit, but are we starting to have conversations about the other vehicles in fleet that um, are, would not switch to electric under the, under the current uh, strategy? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor, yes, we have. As you say, the light duty fleet is, has been proven. It's the low hanging fruit. Um, we are in the process of hiring for, uh, for CCS a green fleet analyst that would, uh, 
would take care of the fleet transition for the light duty fleet, but also within that individual's work uh, to develop a heavy duty uh, fleet transition strategy. And we have been in discussion with, uh, with folks in Quebec. Uh, Lion Electric is, is one of the big uh, manufacturers uh, to, uh, to, to right size the electric vehicle to meet our, our operational needs. So yes, we, we certainly are. Awesome. Um, would that work include uh, contractor services? I'm thinking like our, I mean, there's a shelf life for them, uh, but like, you know, every, every, every uh, once a week, the big, the big lumbering diesel garbage truck rolls down the street, right? Whether it's collecting, recycling, or compost, or whatever you, um, you know, those are not our vehicles, but they're contracted. So it does, how, how does it transition in terms of that procurement contracting world in terms of vehicles that we use as a municipality but we don't actually own because they're really part of our operations too. Uh, yeah, certainly, and that's a, that's a great question. And through the uh, social procurement initiative that's been approved by council, that is something that we can uh, include in those procurement tenders. Uh, so that's something that would likely come out of the, uh, the heavy duty portion of uh, the transition strategy um, as these vehicles are available and, uh, and suitable for our operational needs. Awesome. Totally. I'm yeah. assuming the heavy duty one will come up to us eventually in some sort of report as well when that's ready? Uh, it should, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, apologies for focusing on the to-do list. It's, uh, you know, it's exciting work and it's, it's, it's fun to jump to, okay, great, now, now do the next thing. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Cleary, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so obviously I do support this and looking at the report, and I don't know if people are aware of the tools that you can use to find EV charging stations across Canada, but particularly in Nova Scotia, there's a great one, evassist.ca, and looking at that map, and then looking at the report and the table in the report indicating where we're gonna be putting our chargers, like the, the sports plaques and those places, because you look on the map now, there's nothing in those areas. And so I'm just imagining those little pins dropping uh, as we get that uh, as we get that through. But in this, in, in this particular instance about the building code, and I've had this discussion with our, our lawyers and I know they, they take a much more conservative approach than I do, but there's actually nothing in the Building Code Act or the regulations that prevent us. Like there's no prohibition that says a municipality may not make uh, direction around EV parking and, and charging stations. And so you have to look in there to see what is, uh, what is allowed, and the Act does allow a municipality to make a bylaw as long as it's not inconsistent with the Building Act. And when you look at the regulations, it talks about parking, but it's silent on EV charging stations. So it's not a matter of, again, a, prohib a prohibition for municipalities uh, doing this. Um, and in fact, if you look at our charter, uh, 235 sub 4 sub I, a land use bylaw may require and regulate the establishment and location of off-street parking and loading facilities. And again, I'll have this argument with our, our solicitors uh, over and over again, uh, but I think we actually have the power now. And I know when center plan was first being contemplated, we did actually say we were going to require part EV charging stations uh, to be ready uh, in new buildings, and that never made it into the final draft um, because of that. I think overly conservative view of what our powers are. I will support us writing a letter and saying, hey, change the building code, because that's good for all of Nova Scotia. But I actually think Halifax can do this if we really wanted to. And oddly enough, the minister doesn't have to sign off on our bylaws related to the building code, uh, although they do check them. Uh, and if they're inconsistent, they'll just say, no, you can't do that. I actually think we should and, and try it. And if the minister says no, I guess the minister says no. Uh, but um, anyway, I'll leave it there. I support this. I support a lot more than this, but uh, I recognize where we are at this stage and I want to see this go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next is uh, Councillor Daigle Gowan. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation. And um, I, I did get to read it this morning quickly, which means that I'll probably maybe understand it better by the time I read it the third time. Um, but uh, one of the questions that I did have, and, and um, I was able to uh, participate in one of the events where you get to go on drive and e-vehicle, so that was awesome. And um, out in, I think it was in Tantalan, the event there. Um, 
awesome. It was just lovely. Um, but I'm one of those people that will probably be on the fear grade that I'm driving and all of a sudden it's going to stop and I don't know what I'm going to do. So we did a little bit of homework after I came home and looked at the map of Nova Scotia that uh, Sean talked about that the association, EV Association has a really nice resource available and you can go and look on that. So it was great. Um, my question is, first one, I guess, um, is just around the public charging stations and that first charge that comes up. Is there in any way, is that a cost recovery or is that a cost that will be solely to the municipality? Uh, so through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor, uh, do you mean the capital yes. for that? Yeah, so for the capital, um, there is a potential for revenue through the operation. It, it depends again on what the fees are for that. Um, it would be a cost in municipality to, to install those charging stations, the capital. Uh, like I said, we are we did apply to the uh, the federal program to uh, to cost share that, um, and we will be looking for for other funding opportunities as well to, to to cover those costs. Yeah. So when we get to budget deliberations, I should watch for that to see it in the capital budget. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, for a second time around, Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, intrigued by some of the thoughts of my colleagues there, I, I did want to share as well that, uh, I mean, I think those outreach events are really useful. I had the same reaction as Councillor Deagle Gammon. In fact, we're doing a house project right now um, where we're, we've ripped off our old kitchen and are putting on an addition. And uh, I literally just talked to the contractor at the start of the week, can you put an electric uh, vehicle charging thing? Because we're adding right, out, right off the, the driveway. So we're incorporating that into my own life. And I don't think my headspace would have been there if it weren't for the event out at the Canada Games Centre. So that's really important work um, that's happening uh, for everybody on that. Uh, I'm intrigued by Solicitor Cleary's suggestions and will wholeheartedly uh, suggest, um, you know, uh, endorse any, anything he wants to do there in terms of trying to push our mandate a little bit. I do think we tend to sometimes be a little bit too cautious. And, uh, you know, I, I like his idea of like, well, what's the worst case that scenario? The minister just says, no, you can't do that. Well, then see our letter minister, right? <laughs> so I, 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 li I, li I like that one. Um, and uh, I had a third, but I'm sitting here and I think I've lost my train of thought um, uh, on that note. So uh, I think I'll leave it at that for today and I'll, I'll talk to you after in five minutes when I remember what my third one was. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, I see nobody else on the board. Uh, I have a few questions also. You know, it's interesting. I'm too intrigued by, you know, uh, in, uh, having to mandate new buildings. In my district, Kevin, I've got two may potentially large developments, uh, uh, Shannon Park and, and Port Wallace. And, um, you know, those are significant projects. And do, if we wait for a mandate, uh, we may miss that opportunity. Uh, so can we... A, uh, speak to those that are developing and will they do it anyway as part of the project is what the conversation I'll have. But two, we'll see Councillor uh, Cleary's uh, idea of let's, 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 let's put it in our requirements and see what happens because th you know, th those are significant projects. So I'll be following through on that. I think that's uh, well worthwhile. Could you talk about the, it's funny, you know, I walk my dog every evening in Councillor uh, Dago Gammon's district uh, uh, in, uh, 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 just down the street from me, and there's a subdivision there, uh, Craigburn, and I see a number of electric vehicles parked in driveways, but every one that I see also have taken advantage of our solar program too. Could you talk about the relationship uh, of many of our residents who uh, they may have either, either gotten a rec electric vehicle first and then realized they're gonna power using the solar panels or the, the, the opposite of that? Could you speak to that, please? Uh, certainly, Mr. Chair, it's a, it's a great question and it's fantastic. Uh, it's, uh, as you know, I, I do run the Solar City program as well, so I do speak with residents quite a bit. Um, and, uh, you know, they're typically quite energy conscious. Um, and a lot of them do see the benefit of adding solar on their roof uh, to further offset their cost of, uh, of electricity for charging that vehicle. Um, the, you'll, a lot of misconception, you'll hear a lot from, from individuals that by switching to electric vehicle, you're just charging that vehicle with, with coal. Um, while the grid currently is, you know, 40 to 60% uh, renewable, depending on the day, uh, and it will get greener as, uh, as we go on, residents uh, do have the opportunity to add solar on their roof and it can be 100% renewable. 
Um, solar also is uh, just due to the cost of it, your levelized cost of electricity is much less than what you would pay the utility for. Um, so that quarter of a cost to fill up your tank when compared to gas could be you know, a sixth uh, of, of the cost and there's even much more of a business case. Uh, so it's, it's fantastic to uh, incorporate the two and uh, it, it's great that Councillor Austin is, is, is doing just that. That's you know, Kevin, I think there's an opportunity for a follow-up here from you and your team. You know, we should get that message out, but I hear that all the time. Well, all you're doing is using fossil fuels to charge the vehicle. I think it's important that's front and center. And even to our colleagues, uh, making sure our newsletters and we clarify that, because that is a, a, an obstacle. So speaking of obstacles, uh, the, my last question is, you know, when you look at the average resident in here, you know, are the biggest obstacles for the average residents uh, the lack of inventory, as you alluded to in your presentation? And some the cost. I mean, even though I know, I believe, is it four thousand from each order of each uh, two orders of government uh, uh, subsidies? Could you just speak to that on the obstacles and what those subsidies are? Certainly, yeah. So the subsidies uh, today are up to five thousand dollars from the federal government and up to three thousand uh, dollars from the provincial government for new vehicles. The provincial government does have a two thousand dollar rebate for used electric vehicles, which I think is fantastic um, because, again, there's a misconception. When you think of an electric vehicle, it has to be a $100,000 Tesla, uh, which is not the case. Uh, there are vehicles um, like the Leaf, the Bolt, uh, which are within price ranges, um, you know, akin somewhat to uh, gas-powered vehicles. However, I would say, yeah, the barrier to making that transition is the upfront cost today. It is about a 30% premium. The life cycle costs are there, um, but it is still that, that up, upfront cost that, uh, that is a barrier to people, even with those incentives. Uh, some studies that we've, we've looked at is that uh, electric vehicles will likely reach cost parity you know, sometime after 2025 or so. So it's within reach. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that. Uh, Councillor Morris, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Kevin. Um, if there was a developer who wanted to add EV charging stations to their new development, would it be straightforward for them to do it, or wh what would the process be for them to, to install that? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. Um, there would be a bit of a process. They'd have to get approval from uh, from Nova Scotia Power. Uh, there are permits associated with it. I guess with you know building a whole building, they'd have to go through that process anyway. Um, there are some white papers that were developed for BC uh, that we would like to modify for Nova Scotia so that the developers can have that information in front of them uh, and uh, and follow the process for installing the uh, the EV chargers. Um, it's something that. I'm willing to chat with them currently while it's being developed because um, it, is, it is not that difficult to do um, and to have that infrastructure in place, even just at a minimum the conduit so that you can pull wires after the fact. You know, trying to get conduit into a concrete parking garage after the fact, nobody's going to want to do that. So even just to have appropriate conduit and ensure that your service, electrical service size is large enough, um, you'd be set up for, you know, the next yeah, in, in five years when uh, your, your tenants actually have electric vehicles at that point. So yeah, I'm happy to chat with them for sure. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. I see that Councillor Austin wants to come for the third time now. This is being the Environment Committee. We're all about pushing the rules for the right reasons. So uh, I, I will uh, permit you to definitely come in for a third time, Councillor. Return, so I was hoping to reclaim my minute. Um, uh, just one note when I was looking at the report uh, on, on the locations as I've been scanning it now, um, the uh, s Sportsplex location for our charger, I mean, that makes sense, public building and all. Um, the only thing I'd just uh, leave with you to, to think on in terms of, because I, I, I assume Alderney was probably the other one that was in the running over there. Uh, in terms of like people in the general public asking about charging stations, I've had probably about four or five requests about a charging station at Alderney um, over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, I've never had anyone contact me asking about the Sportsplex, and I think it might be the, just the different sort of usage between those two uh, facilities. Alderney has more of that kind of shopping, uh, popping over uh, sort of thing, where Sportsplex is the, it's, it's a rec destination, right? Um, and so the one, uh, I suspect, probably has more turnover than the other. Anyway, I'll just leave that with you to think on. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. I see no uh, further questions, so it, uh, we call for the question. 
All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Well, happily that motion is carried. And just to clarify, Madam Clerk, this now goes to Regional Council, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. That's good. That's confirmation, so Regional Council, good. Fantastic, uh, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, don't go too far. Uh, up next, we have 12.1.2, Administrative Order 2021-002 OP, respecting the net zero construction of a new municipal facilities within Halifax Regional Municipality. Uh, could I have somebody from the committee put the motion on the floor, please? Okay, Councillor Lovelace, please, thank you. Thank you. I move that the Environment and Sustainability Standing Committee recommend that Halifax Regional Council adopt Administrative Order 2021-002-OP respecting net zero construction of new municipal facilities within the Halifax Regional Municipality as set out in Attachment A of the Staff Report dated August 5th, 2021. Do we have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Dago Gammon. Uh, Councillor Lovelace, do you have anything on this? Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, no, you know, th this is this is a really exciting time that we're in, and being able to contemplate that we're here at this position, um, you know, I I, I, uh, I I've been spending the last couple of days uh, with the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities, you know, and and talking about uh, climate change obviously is extremely uh, relevant, especially to smaller. Uh, municipalities. So, you know, being in a, in a position uh, here at HRM to uh, be able to even contemplate um, putting forward such an uh, ambitious goal, uh, but knowing that, um, you know, being a, a new councillor uh, and uh, moving forward with Halifax and seeing the implementation of this is extremely exciting. And, I, and I'm grateful for staff for all of the work uh, that's been put into this. And um, I'm just excited to finally see all of these little puzzle pieces come together. So I don't have any further of, uh, on this except let's, let's get going. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Austin is first of maybe five times he wants us to be here. I think I can do this one in one, Mr. Uh, Chair. Um, I, I just wanted to emphasize, I mean, I think this is this is good work. Um, the, uh, the one area of concern, and the report does cover it, is the the use of density bonusing, um, because of course how it tended to be used before is we really didn't, I mean, I think the, most of us felt we didn't get good value out of it because we were basically giving a density bonus for things that people were gonna do anyway. Um, we've had some experience now with this. Uh, if uh, the ideal is of course that the, the building code changes and it's just the, thou, thou is required to do these things um, rather than having to do an incentive incentives at all. But if we are going to do incentives, they should really be targeted towards specific energy improvements that there is not the cost benefit on that we're not seeing people build like your geothermal where the upfront is just so expensive um, that uh, it's really not being used all that frequently um, because uh, I'd hate to go back to a place where we're starting to get where we're giving away density bonusing money on things that people are doing anyway right because that's not a public benefit thank you thank you councillor councillor uh, Cleary you have the floor sir Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a, a quick question. So looking at the uh, administrative order, um, obviously this is gonna now apply to future builds, but when we think about the most recent ones, how many of them are net zero ready and how many of them are, are close to being net zero ready? And how many of them would require only minor modifications to get to net zero? I'm thinking of things in District 9, for example, like the new St. Andrews Center. You know, so how, how close is that? Uh, you know, did we consider, and this, it was only just finished, uh, just, uh, well, I'm trying to remember, COVID's messed up my calendar in my head. Uh, it was either just at the beginning of the pandemic or just before, and uh, uh, we're actually doing a ribbon cutting this month for it, a, a year after it's open. Um, so would something like that throw, throw some solar panels on? Is the wiring already up there uh, in terms of you know collecting passive solar? Uh, I know the way it's oriented right now, you couldn't orient it any other way on the site because of the limited footprint. How close are we to that? So looking at some recent builds and stuff that's in process now, are those things net zero or close to net zero? Through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. Um, historically, HRM, we've, uh, We've been striving to reach lead, lead silver um, in our builds. 
um, probably 2018 uh, and onwards, um, the group in CCS have been working with uh, environment and climate change quite closely when each tender goes out to, uh, to strengthen that, to go from lead, um, move away from lead to essentially uh, percent better than code, um, which is actually you know, quite feasible to do, um, even 15 or, or 20 percent better than code. Um, I couldn't say for sure whether or not say, uh, the St. Andrews um, would be net zero. I would say it would like, be net zero ready. Um, however, there are a number of buildings uh, like that, that yes, we could put solar panels if the uh, you know, the roof space permitted, and it would be very, very close to net zero. One that comes to mind is the Acadia Center um, in, in Sackville, which is undergoing some renovations now, and we do um, have plans to put solar on that roof to, to reach net zero. Um, some of our larger facilities, uh, the BMO Center in Bedford, Scotiabank Center, um, trying to think of some others, um, but uh, that are going uh, undergoing deep energy retrofits now. Um, that just adding solar would achieve very, very close to, uh, to that net zero. Um, and yes, a great one is uh, the Dartmouth North uh, Community Center and Library. We're doing a deep energy retrofit on that. We've already installed 75 kilowatts of solar, and when that is complete, that will be net zero. Um, so while this isn't in force now, this AO, um, within the last two years, yes, we've been very proactive in including energy efficiency measures in uh, in, in all those tenders to achieve well beyond the national energy code for buildings. Um, and adding solar will be the next step for those ones, if not already done. Thank you, and I, I appreciate that. And I think to Councillor Mancini's point earlier, these are stories we need to continue to get out there and let people know that it's not that, you know, we've, we're, we've been waiting to do stuff. Uh, you know, Halifax has been with us for a while now, and we were doing stuff while we were creating Halifax, and uh, it's nice that, you know, these, these things, these achievements are already there and we'll have a lot more going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And Kevin, yeah, thanks for mentioning the Dr. North Library uh, Community Center. You, you, you get whispered in your ear, right? So yeah, yeah fantastic. I was going to bring it up. So that's, that's a good news, uh, good news story. Councillor Lovelace. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, I, I thank Councillor Mancini for uh, taking me to uh, see the Dartmouth North Community Center, which is fantastic. Um, I just remembered the question that I had. Um, so I, I'm wondering if you can just chat a little bit about the risks uh, it, you know that w that we have here, considering uh, we do recognize the construction industry is changing at an accelerated rate, new materials, new technologies, new tools, and so on. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about uh, what those risks would be and how we would mitigate them. You know, specifically where it says uh, you know we would be accommodating them in some way. Um, and I'm just trying to understand uh, maybe an example of what that would look like. Uh, so if we're thinking about, um, you know, a building that couldn't potentially be uh, net zero, is there, uh, w what other kind of um, changes could we see there to meet the needs? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor, that, that is a great question. Not all buildings will be able to be built to, to net zero. Um, I would say the, the, the risk to, uh, to not attempting and, and doing that is that the industry won't be in a place um, when they are mandated to do that uh, through the building code. Um, the risk of not achieving net zero um, can be mitigated through the Green Choice Program. Um, so there's a report, I think last in the summer, um, that council endorsed um, to uh, purchase uh, renewable electricity from wi uh, wind farms that will be developed under the Green Choice Program. Um, so there is a limitation to adding solar on a roof. You're typically mm -hmm. you know, limited to how much roof space you have, and if that building needs more electricity, uh, then you will not be net zero. However, if there is that opportunity through the Green Choice Program to purchase off-site renewable electricity okay. to uh, achieve that, uh, that, that net zero. Thank you. Seeing uh, no further questions, uh, if you do, would you like to uh, call for the question? Question Question's been called for. All those in favor? Anyone oppose? That is carried. Kevin, thanks very much. Uh, well done today. Uh, awesome work. Uh, where are we next here? Let's see. Uh, number 13, motions. There are none. No in cameras. Are there any added items? Uh, seeing no added items. Any notice of motions? 
Uh, our, our new solicitor, Cleary, is working on his about uh, mandating, but uh, he'll bring it up at a later date, I'm sure. Uh, now we come to uh, public participation. So happy that we can do public participation, whether there's anybody that's going to participate or not, uh, because we've been doing these meetings virtually. Uh, so uh, let's see here, I have to read the following. Next we will have the public participation section of the meeting. Speakers can participate in person or via the phone for a maximum of five minutes. Please keep your comments respectful on topic and directed to the chair. For those speaking in person, there are lights on the lectern which will turn yellow when you have one minute remaining and red when your time is up. Uh, I'm looking at the, the sign-up list, uh, and we have none on the sign-up list, but I believe there's still maybe somebody in the, uh, in the audience who would like to come forward. Uh, you're welcome to come forward and just step up, sir, and come to the mic and uh, once again introduce yourself and uh, identify from what uh, community that you reside in. And you have five minutes, and welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, five is probably more than I want, but I'm Stephen Mildenberger. I, am, I live in Mushaboom, Nova Scotia, way out the eastern shore, over 100 kilometers from here. Uh, I've been an advocate for electric vehicles. I've had one since the Tesla Model 3s were available, and that was all that was available then. Um, I have solar. I have a large solar array that uh, Kevin would be happy to tell you about. It's uh, a, a two-axis tracker with 90 panels that follows the sun every day. It, pays for my electricity, it pays for my uh, electric car charging, so I have, it heats my house, so basically I'm close to net zero, just have to get my boat on an electric motor. <laughs> so anyway, I've been a great advocate for a long time, and all I really wanted to say here is, is uh, two things. One, I'm, I'm, I'm on the board of EVAC, the Electric Vehicle Association of Atlantic Canada, which was mentioned, and I wanted to thank uh, everybody in, that's involved here at, with, for letting us be part of the development process and the kind of consultation process as you got to this point. So on behalf of the board, I wanted to thank you all for that. And I just wanted to say how impressed I am and some of the other board members that saw the, the document this morning with how progressive it is, how really uh, a few years ago when we started being involved with trying to push electric vehicles, and other green stuff. We were kind of w worried that nothing was happening, so this has been an absolutely marvelous uh, revelation to see what you're doing and how, how progressive, how enthusiastic everybody is. And uh, as EVAC, the EVAC membership, which is over 1,000, probably close to 1,500 now, would uh, certainly like to participate, offer any help they can, any consultation they can, we're, we have the same goals as you, and we would love to be part of anything that we can to make this happen. We're all volunteer. There's no paid membership, so just a lot of enthusiastic people, some, some with electric vehicles, a lot without. That was all I wanted to say. Well, well, no, well thank get, you very much, uh, sir. Sorry, it just occurred to me. I should also comment on your charger locations and your rural strategy, because rural has been the thing that really frustrated me, and where you've positioned chargers and the thought processes and... For example, right now at the start, when you all get to read this document, you find that you have charges at the intersections of highways where uh, vehicles like fleet vehicles, like the couriers as they go electric and the post office trucks and so on, we'll, we'll get to them, we'll use them. It, it's really, really well done, very impressive. Well, thank you very much for your comments, your kind words. You know, uh, uh, council gives direction, but the real work is done by our amazing staff. So thank you for the, those kind words. And we look forward to the invitation on the electric boat when you get that, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, would uh, anyone else like to come forward and speak? Would anyone else like to come forward and speak? I'll call for the third time. Would anybody else like to come forward and speak? Seeing no further speakers, uh, I now will uh, uh, offer the opportunity for those that might be online. Uh, do we have anybody online? I think to speak on phone. So there's no one uh, to speak on the phone. That's that's great. Okay. So where are we next? Uh, that's the end. Three times for people oh, who might be on the phone, uh, please. Uh, Madam Clerk is always uh, diligent in the rules, so I have to uh, ask three times, anybody on the phone would wish to like to speak? Is there anybody who would like to speak online? Anybody from the phone would like to speak? Hearing none, so we uh, close the participation part of the meeting. 
And my next date, of course, the third page of my agenda. You have it there, Henry? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, meeting date is December the 2nd here again in Chambers. However, I would like to announce ahead of time, I may break in protocol, but we've invited the uh, Minister of Environment to come to the next meeting and he's confirmed that he will come and speak about his environmental goals. So we're looking forward to that, uh, that presentation. So we're looking for an adjournment. Uh, Councilor Lovelace, thank you very much everyone. Uh, drive uh, home safely. Thanks to all that came and presented today and the staff. Uh, uh, enjoy your day. Thank you. Thanks, Josh.